Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today is the 28th of November of 2020, and this is part three of my podcast series on why you should consider critical care medicine as your career. Every now and then, you get a call from a clinician who you don't necessarily get along with, who will be asking you for help to take a look at their patient and help them get through whatever mess they're in. It's a nice feeling to be able to help these people and, more importantly, the patient. It definitely helps to mend old wounds from discord. Other physicians will trust you to take care of their patients. Every specialty and subspecialty has their pros and cons. You may have a less stressful life in another subspecialty. Let's be honest, people find stress in every situation. That's why you see these multimillionaires with. Obviously, a high stress environment isn't something you could just jump into from one day to the next and be okay with it. Over the course of the years, months, days, you get trained to handle it. Sometimes you're even conditioned to handle it. Things that you were never thought capable of doing will come to you as second nature. You will be calm at your baseline heart rate while others panic in the room. You know, TV shows where they have their problems, which you think all are stupid, but to them, they're really, really big problems. If you're a nurse practitioner or PA and you're going to go into a subspecialty, is is the subspecialty that you're going to go into make you turn into a glorified scribe? Or are you actually going to manage patients? It's not like you're going to go ahead and and perform an endoscopy if you work with a gastroenterologist. But you could correct me if I'm wrong. I've already gone through part one and part two, so check those out before you check this one out. At that time, your presence will be a calming feature for those around you. As an APP in the ICU, you will surely intubate, play central lines, place chest tubes, have difficult conversations with family, and enjoy the glories of the big wins. Recently, there's an MP student who's working with me. He placed chest tube and performed an intubation in the span of two days. His first for both. Of course, you got to remember that this is a recruiting pitch. I may be embellishing a bit for the sake of having some. The level of training that you will receive to become a practitioner in critical care, whether you are a nurse, a respiratory therapist, an APP, or a clinician, is a cut above, in my opinion, every other subspecialty or specialty makes you very, very proficient at every single craft. Here's an example. So specialists, generally speaking, tend to worry about one organ system. Neurologists, the brain. Cardiologists, the heart. Gastroenterologists, the GI tract. As an intensivist, it's my responsibility to be proficient at every single organ system. But I will willfully admit that I'm awful at dermatology, as well as ophthalmology. So don't ask me a single thing about those. GI, please scope this person. If they came in for a GI bleed, obviously I'm not going to call the GI doctor to come into the middle of the night unless I've already tucked in their GI bleed to the best of my ability, fix their underlying coagulopathy, etc. When I consult my nephrology colleagues, I ask them to dialyze the patients. Obviously I'm oversimplifying this, but you understand the point. I love my colleagues. I'm not trying to throw shade at them for being one-dimensional. I'm not calling them one-dimensional, but I might be oversimplifying it and making it seem like they're one-dimensional. That's not my intention. You're also dealing with the best people in the hospital, and that also pushes you to be your best. As a physician, I get to deal with the best critical care nurses. They watch my ICU patients for me if I have to step off the floor to go to an emergency somewhere else. They have my cell phone numbers. When my cell phone rings and it's the charge nurse on my caller ID, I know something bad is happening that they need me at the bedside. There's a lot of trust involved in this. You also get to work with the best respiratory therapists. They're the ones who make amazing suggestions on the best ways to manage your ventilators and therefore your patients. They also might have some strategies in their back pocket, which one is not aware of. The education comes fast in the ICU. We're in the cutting edge around these parts. There's always new technology for us to play with to optimize our patient care and improve outcomes. There are new tests, new treatments, and honestly, it's a lot of So now let's talk about the big saves and the big wins. There are people who come into the ICU in such a state of illness that you're honestly unsure whether they're going to make it or not. And this part cannot be highlighted enough. When you have a patient who's on the brisk brink of death and you and your team are able to bring them back from certain death, it's amongst one of the most rewarding aspects of this career. I'm someone who honestly needs to feel a sense of purpose. And I feel that purpose is one of the factors of life that make it actually worthwhile. Having a sense of purpose provides a sense of fulfillment that sometimes money you know, money is just not the same. It cannot provide you that same sense of satisfaction in life. You could get, for example, a $200 bonus right now, and you're going to feel good about it for a little while. But 
knowing that you directly save someone's life due to your aggressive management of a patient will stay with you forever. Those 200 bucks will go away to something you're eventually going to throw away later on. But that memory, that experience of saving somebody's life, that's going to stay with you forever. And then you and your team can reminisce on those huge wins. You know, remember that guy or gal who we saved? It definitely helps the ego, especially when you can't save everyone. I've had numerous big saves in my career, and I remember each and every one of them-ish kind of clearly. But my mom often reminds me to write down the huge wins, but I think that's a little bit excessive. The big wins are also great to remember when things are tough. And of course, they will get tough. This is not an easy job. It's extremely rewarding when these patients come back and their families to visit you in the ICU. I recall when I was in fellowship, I had a patient and his wife who I took care of, and the patient was extremely, extremely sick. She immediately recognized me one day when I was at a department store buying a suit. My mom saw as this lady came up to me, verified who I was, and gave me a huge hug. It was honestly a very proud moment for my mom. The actual patient, though, of course, had no idea who I was, though. But it was, you know, quite comical, but understandable. He was on the brink of death. It's only natural now that we move on to talking about death. Because in the ICU, we save many people. But unfortunately, many people also die in the ICU. Truth is, as much as we might be in denial, we're all going to die one day. And those of us who are in these parts of healthcare see death regularly, sometimes daily. I hate to say it, but seeing someone who has passed becomes kind of ordinary when we pronounce them. As we watch people who pass away to the next life in different manners, whether it be with us doing chest compressions during a code or a compassionate extubation, we constantly think about our own mortality and that of our family members and loved ones. We know deep inside what we would want. And amongst the team, we playfully say, hey, you know, if you ever see me this sick, pull the plug. Although, you know, that's, that's just for the sake of fun. And yes, it's kind of weird that we talk about death in a fun light. Weird, we know. When the transition from aggressive management to comfort measures is made, or a patient who is a DNR is passing away in my ICU on the ventilator, I personally try to take the best care I can of them. Well, just like everybody else, but I, I make sure to look at their vital signs and take a look at their face, make sure that they're not suffering. I make sure that they don't have like a grimace on their face, that their brow isn't furrowed, make sure they're not tachycardic. And one of the things I like to do here is involve the family and ask them if it looks like their loved one is suffering because they know their facial expressions better than I ever will. To see somebody pass away comf comfortably in the presence of their family without suffering is honestly the most beautiful thing we could ask for when it comes to something that's, that is as inevitable as death is for all of us. Believe it or not, there is an alternative that is worse. We don't want anyone to die with us doing chest compressions on them unless they really need it. I could dig far deeper into this whole topic, but the truth is there's so many differing philosophies out there that I'm not going to impose my thoughts on this and others. We all know what we would want and what's right for us. Let's talk now about family dynamics and the people who love their loved ones, as redundant as that might sound. To see a family come together despite their differences in difficult times is very rewarding. Sometimes you'll have a very sick person who's on life support and the family will tell you to do whatever you reasonably be you reasonably could do to buy time for them to arrive at the bedside. They mentioned that they're either getting in their car from another state or jumping in on a plane. They keep their word and you want to work really hard to allow them to come by and say their, their final goodbye. There have been numerous times where I have done what I can to buy the patient an extra couple hours or so of being alive while avoiding suffering, of course, to allow the family to get there. Sometimes it doesn't work, but when they're able to get there, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Also, having the patient's family at the bedside throughout the ICU course is also invaluable. I know that there are a bunch of nursing meme pages out there who make ugly commentary about things, and I know that's all for fun and all that, but I personally like to have the family at the bedside. During the course of the hospitalization, I train the family members at what I'm looking for, what the ventilator settings are, what the drips that their loved one is receiving are for, if, you know, the vasopressor requirement goes up, they know that things are getting worse. If the vent settings are improving, then likely the patient is heading in the right direction. And I know this isn't a hard and hard and fast rule, but they know that unless the PEEP is 5 and the FiO2 is less than 50%, chances are I'm not thinking about extubating the patient that day. Obviously, there's a bunch of wiggle room there. But in that process, one could build trust with the family and make them part of the integral team. 
If things go south, they can see it happening. They recognize the sense of urgency or disappointment in our voices and our body language. The family knows that we have done everything in our power to save the life of their loved ones. Therefore, stopping aggressive management and transitioning towards comfort measures becomes more of a fluid process. When the patient does inevitably pass away peaceful, peacefully in our ICU, the family comes out and gives the staff huge hugs and how grateful they were that you and your team took such good care of their loved one. And guys, this is like real love. This is real appreciation. I know that we all bicker about nonsensical stuff all the time every day, but when you're hugged by an otherwise complete stranger who's thanking you for allowing their loved one to pass away with peace, dignity, and their family at the bedside, guys, this is something that's completely invaluable. I know that we want to save everybody, but the truth is that we can't. We should strive to make sure we do everything we do to avoid death and suffering as perfectly as we can. Like I said before, we can't we can't save them all. And so to finish off this podcast, I'm going to talk about career fulfillment, at least in my opinion, in my 3.5 years that I've been a critical care specialist, uh, plus two years of training in critical care medicine fellowship, plus medicine training and all that stuff. It's currently November of 2020, like I mentioned before. Today, I have zero regrets of the journey that I have been on and the journey that I'm on today. People are easily able to identify how passionate I am about my career. And I I really want you to join along with me because I hope that you'll find the same pleasure that I have in in all of this. Part of the reason that I'm so passionate is just the sense of fulfillment, the sense of purpose that this all brings to me. And this is why I do all these different things such as, you know, this podcast, YouTube, my website, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all this, all these different things so that we could all collectively expand our knowledge in the specialty and hopefully recruit some more people to join in on the experience. Please don't hold me back as I likely missed a lot of points in this particular podcast, but please recognize that I'm human and I do make mistakes. I meant everything in this podcast with the best intentions, although somebody will likely misconstrue a point I made to make it seem as if I'm as if it's bad. That that again wasn't my intention. Thank you for sticking around all the way to the end of this podcast. I appreciate your support, everybody. Let me know if you have any feedback on all this or something you'd like for me to add to it. But I think that'll be enough for today. Hope you guys have a great day. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye.